This is chapter two, lesson two uh, for AP Stats. Um, we're looking at normal distributions. It is to be a normal distribution, what the curve looks like, and how we can interpret that curve. So as you watch the video, I want you to think about what does it mean for a distribution to be normal, and how can this provide us with additional information about our distribution. So we can use a, dense, a density curve, a normal density curve, to, to describe a normal distribution. It's going to be nice and symmetric around the mean. It looks like a bell-shaped and it's going to be described by two numbers. It's mean, mu, which we use right here, this symbol to indicate it, and it's standard deviation. And we use this symbol to indicate the standard deviation. So we'll oftentimes write n, uh, and in parentheses, the mean first and standard deviation second. Keep in mind with z-scores, they're going to be centered around the mean, of, and so the z-score would be 0, and the standard deviation will always be 1 because of the transformations we talked about in our last class that subtracting um, a mean from itself would give us zero in a numerator, so the mean would be zero for z-scores, and dividing standard deviation by itself would give us one, uh, thus making the standard deviation of z-scores one. So the mean of a normal distribution is at the center of the symmetrical normal curve. So since it's symmetric, the median and mean are equal. There's no skew, so the mean's not getting pulled right or left by the tail there. The standard deviation is going to be the distance from the center to the change of curvature points on either side. Let's take a look at what that looks like. So there's different ways we could have symmetrical curves, some with a larger standard deviation, some with a smaller standard deviation. If they're going to have a smaller standard deviation, then that means the average distance from the mean is smaller, so most more of the uh, values are clumped around the mean, making it taller, because more are clumped in the middle around the mean, and the standard deviation is smaller. Whereas here, we have a larger spread. Overall, our data is more spread out. It's not so clustered around the mean, so we have a larger standard deviation. Remember, standard deviation measures the average distance of each data point in the distribution from the mean. So a way of visually seeing that is that where this point's curve changes, where it stops being so steep, is the measure of one standard deviation. So here, this shows you where that is on this point, one standard deviation away. You could follow the curve with your finger, and then where it starts to, to flatten out right there is one standard deviation. Same thing up here. We have a peak, we go down it, and where it's getting steeper, 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 and then right here is where it stops getting as steep. You know, the, the slope doesn't decrease anymore. So that's one standard deviation away, a way of visually checking what one standard deviation looks like. Now we can use a rule, the 68-95-99.7 rule, to give us an approximation of how many values lie within a certain interval of the mean. So we know that approximately 68% of our observations are going to be within one standard deviation of the mean. So that means greater than or less than the mean, uh, since they could be within one plus one standard deviation or less than one standard deviation. Approximately 95% of observations fall within two standard deviations of the mean. That means the mean plus two standard deviations or minus two standard deviations. And about 99.7% fall within three standard deviations, so the mean plus three times the standard deviation or the mean minus three, minus three standard deviations would give us the interval that has 99.7%. Now, um, that describes distributions that are exactly normal. Uh, rarely do we have data that's exactly normal, so this usually gives us a good approximation of the data. In our work packet, we'll see a couple more proofs of how it approximates it. We looked at how close it was for batting averages with the curve versus the histogram in lesson one. In this next lesson, we'll see a couple more uh, just uh, data sets that will show us that it's a good rough approximation for data that's approximately normal. So here's some nice visuals of what I was just talking about. Um, on page 114 you get a nice clear uh, idea of what this is in your book too. So turn to your pause right now, turn to your book and look at page 114 so you get a clear idea. So here's our mean with a z-score of 0 because it's uh, 0 standard deviations from the mean. 68% of our data falls within one standard deviation. And keep in mind, one standard deviation is where the curve stops being as steep on both sides. So our mean would be a dotted line from zero up to the peak. 68% of our data will be within one standard deviation, greater than or less than the mean. 95% will be within two standard deviations, which is indicated by this, the center part and it, as well as this second darker turquoise part on both sides. So 60 our 95% of our data will be from negative 2 to 2 standard deviations. And finally, 99.7% will be between negative 3 and 3 standard deviations. Which is why when we looked at the home run king analysis, all those scores being above 3 
makes them very rare for their data set. Uh, scores above three are, are rare, and Babe Ruth's score being above five is um, incredibly rare. So shows you how good of a performance that really was relative to the rest of the players who played then, because he was so much, um, his, he had so many more home runs than they did. Um, so, and then this is another way of seeing the shading. About 68% of our data lies within this red area. If you add this green area here, and then the other corresponding green area on the other side, we'd have 95%. And if we had all the way up through three standard deviations, we'd have 99.7%. Again, look at page 114 if you haven't already to get a better visual of this. So the normal distribution with mean zero and standard deviation one is a standard normal distribution. And we call that a standard normal distribution because it's been standardized, meaning we've divided by the standard deviation and it tells us how many standard deviations we are away from the mean, hence the name standard normal distribution. Uh, again, our z-score is here given by the data point minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. So in your, um, in your outline, there's a couple links included to show you visuals of the standard normal distributions and a tool here. So this tool lets me drag and see what interval, how, what percentage of my values are between negative one and one z-score. And you can see it's just about 68% here, a little bit over, 68.26%. So if I, do the, if I drag it the other way and take it through here, it shows me how many values are greater than one or less than one. If I wanted one tail, I could take that off and it would just show me the, the value of one tail. So meaning it shows me that here at two, 2.28% of my observations or 0 0.0028 lie greater than two z scores away. So this is a little tool for you uh, to look at and notice that this is a standard normal distribution because the mean zero and the standard deviation is one. We could change that if we needed it for our data set to reflect that. So again, if we wanted it to be one tailed and we wanted to see uh, Bay of Ruth's score was way up here above five, you can see how small the numbers get and how unlikely it is that that would be there. Right now we're at one uh, tenth of a percent of our data would be greater than that z-score, which is even off the charts. So it's pr it looks like it's about three and a half. So very rare to have z-scores that high. So this is one tool you can use uh, located on the book's website. And uh, it tells you the areas here. So we wanna, when we find a z-score, you can look to the left or look to the right. We can also use table A to do this in our back of our book. So if we're given a z-score, we can refer to table A, um, look at the appropriate z-score um, for our data point, and then from there, we can figure out what percent of the observations are less than it, um, or if we wanted to figure out what per percent of the observations were greater than it. So if we know that this area to the left of 0.1587 is 0.1587, the left of negative one, then we could subtract that from one to figure out what the total area is to the right here. So keep that in mind, one tool. Another tool uh, is this other link that I gave you uh, for, on, the, on the outline. So this just shows you parameters and you can choose above, below, or between. So if I wanted to know how many people in my baseball example had between negative one and one z-score, so that's centered around the mean. Um, these would be your average players, the middle, middle set of your data, 68%, middle 68% of your data. Uh, it'll show me here in a visual with my, with my z-scores. And then it'll show me my shaded area down here, which is about 68.2689%. So this gets even more exact than the other website. If I wanted to see how many people lied between negative two and one z-score, it would give me that area. Uh, if I wanted to see how many people were really bad and were between negative three and negative two, so notice when I do negative two to negative two, it goes down to zero because it's not an interval there. So that would be the the bottom percent, that would be 0.3 point, 0.15% of your data would be down there for the batting average problem. This would be the worst batting averages. If we took it up to two to three to see what, what percentage of people were up there from two to three, then that would give us that value there, 0.15% of our data lies there. So you should also be comfortable using the standard normal table, table A, it's in the back of your book. We've used the table of random digit, ta table D, table of random digits. Now we're gonna use the standard normal table. And it tells you the probability um, to the left of Z, um, the probability, the likely percent of your distribution that's less than that Z score. So keep in mind, it always tells you to the area to the left. There's a picture up top to remind you of that. 
Um, there's also a function on your calculator. We'll briefly go over in class to do this. But you'll find the z-score, and then you'll look over in the table of digits to figure out what the corresponding area is under that curve. If we wanted the area to the right here, then what we would do is we would subtract, we'd get this value of the area and subtract one from it, since the total area under any density curve is one. Let's take a closer look at that table A. So if I had a z-score of 0.82, I would go down to z equals 0.8, and then I would go over to see where 0.02 is. This represents the hundredths column up top. So 0.82 would be right here, and it looks like that says 0.7939. Again, the scan from my book is not the best, but this, this is in your book as well. But you would use the tenths column here. This takes it to the ones and the tenths. And then if there's a digit in the hundredths, so if you have a score of 0.91, you would look at 0.9 and see where that means 0.01, and that would be your z-score there, 0.8186. Now to figure out what the, that gives you the area to the left of z. If we wanted the area to the right of that to see how many are greater than 0.91, how many, what percentage of our values are greater than 0.91 standard deviations above the mean, we would take 1 minus 0.8186 uh, to get a little bit over 18%. I think it'd be 18.14% uh, or greater than the z-score there. So that's how we use table A. Uh, take a look at your book for more examples of that and flip to table A in the back of your book now to check it out. So to solve problems uh, involving normal distribution calculations, you'll first state the problem. We use state, plan, do, and conclude. Just like every other time, we'll continue to use this throughout the year. So get used to that. State, plan, do, and conclude. Um, state the problem in terms of the variable of interest x. That means you're stating what the question is we're trying to answer. Plan by drawing a distribution and shading the, the area of interest. So draw out the normal curve. Uh, put a line where the z-score is, and then shade the area. Do we want greater than that z-score or less than that z-score? If it's greater, you know you're going to have to take the value from table A and subtract it from 1. If it's less than, you know you can just use that value from table A. Do perform any calculations. So figure out your, your z-score, standardize x, which is the z-score. Use that z-score and table A to figure out the total area um, and the fact that the total area is under the curve is 1 to figure out what is the area that you're interested in, and then conclude, again, by answering the question of interest. I mean, you're directly answering the question that, that we're trying to address with this whole problem in terms of the problem, um, and you're citing your data that you perform in your calculations here. Never assume that a distribution is normal unless, it's, uh, unless you know it or unless you can see it in the numbers that are there. Uh, so if a graph's skewed, uh, if there's multiple modes, which would be, appear as peaks, if it's not got a bell shape to it, then that's all evidence that it's not normal. We can only apply, apply this approximation for the 68, 95, 99.7 rule um, with a normal curve. And it can also provide us evidence if the curve is normal or not. So if it's exactly normal, it'll fall under those exact values. If it's approximately normal, they'll be very close to that. If it's not normal, then you'll see the values are far off from there. Uh, another way we can do that is look at a normal probability plot, which plots the z-scores. So we arrange data from smallest to largest, figure out the percentile of each observation, and then we use the standard normal distribution uh, table A, or there's an invert in INV NORM function on your calculator to find the z-scores at those percentiles. So it'll plot a normal probability plot, which looks like this. So we plot each individual value x against the z-score. If the points lie close to a straight line, the plot indicates that the data are normal. Here you can see we have a graph. Which way is it skewed? Pause and answer. Now we have a normal probability plot. Not a straight line. So you can see that since this is not a symmetrical graph, we don't end up with a linear normal probability plot. So any deviations or any like systematic deviations means you see a pattern of deviations, a nice curve here instead of a line. So it's not normal. Uh, so outliers would be far away from the rest. Um, the rest of the data seems to be here on a curve. So this is not a normal graph. Let's look closer. You can see I have my x values here, the frequency that they appear here on my histogram. We have a skewed right graph, significant skew. Here we have the uh, x values, and here we have their z-scores. We can see that they don't appear in a linear fashion. A straight line appears, and then we know that it's normal. Page 128 to 129 has normal probability plots on your calculator. Uh, here's the multiple choice. So what is the approximate area under a normal curve 1, 2, and 3 standard deviations away from the mean? 
You have to think about if it's greater than and less than, greater than or less than, one or the other, or both. Pause now, please, and answer.